It's such a soft summer evening out there. It's pretty nice just to be out in the air. Um, Those of you who close the windows around the sides because it's cool where you're sitting, um, could you open them a bit just because in the middle it'll get too hot. So some some middle path of opening. They don't have to be all the way open. (laughs) That way we'll roast more evenly on all sides. So again, let yourself sit in a way that's at ease and comfortable and listen. You can kind of listen in a relaxed and even meditative way. Um, It's not that you have to remember any of this stuff, really. (laughs) I think it's more that it reminds you of something you already know in some way. It might be some moment that does, and, and that's what's important. So, I was reflecting before this evening's uh, talk, earlier today and last day or so, about coming up to uh, do Monday night in in this new and beautiful meditation hall. And I've been working on the introduction to a, a book that a friend of mine just completed, a new book on my teacher, Ajahn Chah, some of his teachings. And because I've been reading those stories and reflecting about it, it made me want to go back to uh, tell some of the tradition from which this place and community and the uh, practices um, are born. I turned it on, Leslie. Mm. Uh, because there's a certain way in which you can come in, especially if you're sort of new to Spirit Rock, and it's this kind of California, a little bit of Asian flavor architecture, and here it is, and it's in Marin, and um, where is it? where did this come from? Not just the buildings, but also the teachings and practices. Um, and when I look out the windows on this side of the meditation hall, and there's still light into the forest, and those paths that are cleared under the trees, it's uh, a reminder to me of the great forest temples where for a thousand, two thousand, two thousand five hundred years in some cases, um, the teachings of liberation have been carried and passed from one generation to another. Um, just as if, my friend, said the Buddha, one who was faring through the forest, through the great wood, should see an ancient path, an ancient road traversed by people of former days. Even so have I, O monks, nuns, seen such an ancient path, an ancient road traversed by the rightly enlightened ones of former times. And then the Buddha goes on and says, O you who are the sons and daughters of the Buddha, O nobly born, um, O you of every caste and creed, every race and color and background, um, the doors of the Dharma are open to you to practice. And the Dharma is the Sanskrit word that means the truth or the teachings. And what it points to is the possibility of human liberation, of the liberation of the heart. And this possibility of human freedom is what's been passed on from one warm hand to the next in generation after generation in the great monasteries and practice centers. Um, and now it's our turn <coughs> to discover it in our, in our own lives. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, who was um, one of the masters in the tradition of the elders, the Theravada, which means the way of the elders, 
and his picture is up here, one of his pictures, um, was an exemplar of this teachings that we carry here at Spirit Rock. Um, And he carried it more than anything in his being. You would come to meet him and he would teach with tremendous love and incredible uh, sensitivity and attention and great humor um, and at the same time a kind of unshakability of spirit. Um, And he was a happy person even though he had suffered a lot in his life, and even the life that he lived as a forest monk had quite a bit of privation and um, struggle at times, Um, there was this great radiance of well-being that came from this human being, no matter what the circumstances. And when you came into the monastery for training, as one might come here for retreats for a week or a month or longer, um, what was offered was a sacred container, a situation for a kind of inner initiation, an inner transformation for those who chose to enter. The monastery was some hundreds of acres of great and ancient forest. And you walked in and there were some signs there that said, okay, you've got here, now quiet down (laughs) and start to listen. You know, you've been running around enough. This is the place to start to listen. Um, And the situation that he created as a sacred center was one of tremendous uh, dignity. Um, You were asked from the beginning to be mindful in an impeccable way. The bell would ring in the forest at 3 a.m., wake up three in the morning, and you hear it ringing through the trees. I didn't like getting up at three, it was too early. But I would kind of roll over and then I'd get up and do some walking and sitting meditation and go to chanting. Um, And the training was to sweep the paths, to uh, walk in meditation, to join together um, in the drawing of water from the wells, to sit in your... um, seat in the Dharma Hall in meditation, uh, to fold your robes, um, all of it to be done in an impeccable and beautiful way. Um, It was really a place where the teacher said, we can live with a presence and a dignity that has almost been forgotten in this world. And while it was difficult, and of course part of what's difficult is also part of what transforms us, um, he said, Uh, when you came in, um, Ajahn Chah said, uh, there are um, two kinds of suffering. There's the suffering that you make by running away from your life and the difficulties and the problems, trying to escape. And he said, that running is endless. You may have noticed that. And then he said, there's the suffering that comes when you are willing to stop and face your life completely and exactly as it is, your own body and heart and mind, and discover in the midst of it that heart of freedom. So the purpose of coming, he said, is to stop and discover that in your own way. We would get up in the mornings and go out after a couple of hours of sitting in meditation and walking and then an hour of chanting before dawn with our begging bowls on an alms round and walk. The younger monks would go 5, 10, 15 miles round trip to one of the villages at some distance um, and walk through the streets uh, in silence. And people had gotten up early to cook their own rice and their own curry for the day before they went out to work in the fields. And they would wait uh, along the streets in a very reverent fashion and then put food in your bowl. And sometimes it was the villages where people were very poor in the dry season, very little food, you know, and then someone would put a mango or some wonderful fruit in your bowl, and you don't say, oh, thanks for the mango, you know, I'm dying for a good piece of fruit, or something <laughs> like that. You just have to be silent and kind of mindful. But the, the, the generosity of their giving, it's as if they would say, We have very little food in this village, but we so value what you represent 
we so value that you carry for our society centeredness and compassion and peace, that you remind us what's possible, that we're going to give of the little food we have to support you too, so that you can keep that spirit shining for all of us in our community. You know, and what could you do when you went back? The only way to honor such generosity was to do one's own practice with a real integrity. It was one of the great beauties of my life to go out in the dawn, across the rice paddies and into the villages like that. But the training was not so easy. We didn't sit on these nice comfy cushions, you know, with a, a, a heated floor underneath them. It was a stone floor, right? And you had a sitting cloth, which was one layer of monk's robe that you'd unfold, one thin piece of cotton, and then you'd sit there. And, ah, oh, I had such a hard time. I mean, I'm not used to sitting on the floor as a Westerner, even as a young man. And so I would get to the meditations early at night because it would hurt so much. Um, and I would sit next to one of the big pillars that held up the roof of the Dharma Hall. And after everyone closed their eyes and began to meditate, then I would lean back <laughs> against the pillar. And after a couple of weeks of being there, I didn't know that anybody saw me, but after a couple of weeks, Ajahn Chah did this Dharma talk and he said, and the spirit of our practice is to sit with the dignity of a Buddha upright and not need to lean on anything. And then he looked at me and said, okay. You know. And sometimes we'd have to sit. We sat all night once a week. We, we did the sitter's practice where you wouldn't lie down um, once a week. Um, some people undertook it for months at a time as a way to kind of... Um, really practice the possibility of wakefulness. When I heard that, I couldn't believe it. I said, all right, you know, one meal a day is fine, but not sleeping, come on. Um, but in fact, uh, all of these things, he, he, we also would sit with the teacher, and he could sit comfortably for hours and hours. Sometimes there'd be a visiting monk, and he'd be chatting away a little bit, and then he'd sit a little more, and have another conversation, do a little teaching, and then continue to sit two, three, four, five hours, and we'd be sitting there dying. You know, and he'd kind of peek over at us like, are you surviving? And then he'd go on with his conversation. We call them torture sessions sometimes, right? Um, but the idea was not that he made you do something that he was unwilling to do. He was right there with everyone. When it was cold, we would go out together in the coldest of winter on alms rounds. And he would say, cold, isn't it? And smile. And we'd be shaking and shivering and freezing and come back and eat our food. And it was when we were dying of heat. He'd be sweating with the rest of you. He'd say, hot, isn't it? And smile, how are you doing? And it was such an inspiration to have an elder who had lived through all of that to say, this is the way it is, and it's still possible to be free. Care with everything. How you made the brooms to sweep the paths of the forest, how you um, worked to repair the buildings. Um, and, and I see it, the kind of surrender, even on the retreats here, people will come for... 10 days or two weeks or a month and who've never been silent and leave all these things behind. And it's the beginning of the same kind of training, even though we didn't have little sinks in our rooms and kind of it's a little more elegant. But I remember one of the first retreats I taught in Southern California 20 some years ago at Yucca Valley. And this very beautiful woman came on retreat, young woman, who was a um, L.A. Hollywood um, model and kind of B-movie star of some kind, anyway. Um, and she came, and she was sitting and walking with everybody else, trying it. And I noticed that she was really made up every time she came into her interview. So I said to her after a few days, I said, you know, you don't have to put your makeup on here because we're not supposed to be looking at each other, you know. She said, I don't. I said, why don't you try it? I mean, here you are on retreat. Um, letting go of things, why not let go of that too? She said, I don't know, it's been you know, 20 years, I've never, <laughs> I don't remember when I said, so well, give it a try. Um, and when you entered the forest monastery, you would leave your jewelry and your um, uh, identity and your clothing and take on the robes of a novice or a monk. Um, and you would leave your name behind. The elders would take you into the trees and initiate you and give you a practice of asking, who are you really? Who was born into this body? Um, and give you a new name. And the name they would look at you and listen to you and try and find a name 
Um, maybe it was the one who seeks peace, you know, which means, of course, you don't have it yet, but you're, at least you're, you're looking in that direction, or whatever name. Um, so there was a tremendous amount of surrender, but it was the surrender for a purpose. It wasn't a blind surrender. It was, are you willing to be with your life directly and immediately um, as it is? Uh, And that you learn that you can trust that life, that you can trust your body, um, that you can trust uh, that food will come. It did come. We'd sit out for funerals in the forest at night in the charnel grounds with the uh, cremation pyre. And then we would sit up all night in the forest and we would take turns being alone in the forest with the charnel grounds and just practice reflecting on our own death and the fact that everything dies and can we sit and find a peacefulness, a centeredness in the midst of all of that? He trusted that the purpose of those who came to the monastery was to grow, was to learn, was to discover freedom. And when it was difficult, he would test people or he would tease them. You know, if you were having a hard time or whatever, he'd go up to you and say, having a hard day? He'd just ask, he'd notice it. Or are you angry? He'd notice if you were angry. And you say, yeah, I'm angry about that. And he'd say, well, whose fault is that? You know, who's really making you angry? Is somebody else making you angry? Somebody else making you have certain feelings? You know, or maybe it would be a festival day and there'd be all these visitors and the, the cars and trucks, people full, you know, driving up the dirt road to the monastery and the air dusty or something like that. And some people would say, oh, I like it when the monastery is so quiet and peaceful. I don't want all that noise. And he would say, you know, it's, uh, he said, suppose you go and sit in the middle of the freeway with the cars and trucks speeding down around you. And then you get angry at the car shouting, don't come this way, don't drive that direction, drive someplace else. But it's the freeway. You can't tell them that. What can you do? You have to understand things are the way they are. You have to see things the way they are. The road is the place for cars. And if you don't want to be where the cars are, then you move yourself. Similarly, when sounds come, you think they're bothering you, but you have it backward. It is actually you who go out and bother the sound. (laughs) So when it was difficult, he would just get kind of playful and say, oh, you're having difficulties. How's it going, huh? More entangled than you used to be? And after creating this situation of great dignity and presence where we, as initiates, would, would um, vow in a certain way or take the inner resolution that whatever comes up in this place of practice, we will learn from. We will make it to be the focus of our training of liberation and compassion. Then he would say, all right, we have this place of dignity. Now you have to see clearly. And it's essential in spiritual life. It's not just hearing teachings or trying to follow some outer path, but looking at what's true in in our own life, honestly. And he was very honest about himself. He said, I got into this as a child. He said, first of all, my father died when I was quite young, and I sat with him as he was dying. And I remember the moment that he died, and there was just this bag of meat he would say, of flesh, that was no longer my father. And it was the most puzzling, somewhat frightening, but extraordinary thing. uh, You know, remember the first time you saw a dead body? And then you thought, wait a second, who does this happen to? Um, Whoops. Uh, He said, and it gave me so many questions. Then how do you live, knowing that all that we feel is so important is going to end? He said, and as a monk, he said, I don't know, I was always attracted this, to this. When we were little kids in the village, we used to play house, and some would be the farmer, and some would be the, you know, the wife or the husband or whatever. And I would always say, well, let me be the monk. You know, and I'd sit up higher than everybody else and relax while they worked. And then I'd have them bring me candy and food, he said. And I thought, this is a pretty good deal. But then when I really began to practice, he would talk about it, I had so many problems. I spent years living in caves and in the forest and studying with the other elders of the generation before me, 
Uh, I had so much suffering and body pain and doubts. And I would sit in the forest sometimes and it would start to rain and I'd be weeping and I couldn't tell if it was my own tears or if it was the rain that was coming down. And I would just cry and cry. But something in me had, the word he used was a certain quality of daring that you need as well, he would say. The, the, the willingness to touch every part of this life, the, the 10,000 joys and sorrows. He said, I got malaria, I was so sick, I was you know, 30 years old and they thought I was 60. Um, but I just kept practicing because I knew, I saw with my teachers that it was possible to be free. So he was very honest about himself. I remember going to visit him after I'd been teaching for a number of years and he'd come here to America to our center in the East Coast. And I was back with him. And um, one day we were in the part of the forest where a group of people came to visit him for a healing. And they said, this woman is sick with cancer and she's been to the doctors. It's not clear, you know, what will happen to her. Um, But we've come to you, O great master. And they bowed and made offerings and so forth. Would you please do a blessing prayer and some healing? And so he did a prayer and a blessing and some healing. And then they left. And he turned to me, he kind of elbowed me. He said, did I heal them? I said, I don't know, did you? He said, I don't know either. And I said, well, why did you ask me? And he said, it's like this. He said, if I didn't heal them, um, then she'll die and no one will say anything about it. They tried everything. They tried medicine, they tried the master, and that's how it was. That's the way life is. But if she doesn't die, then they're all going to go around and say, oh, this great teacher, he's the one who kept me alive. Is that how it is, huh? Is that what you do in America? You heal all these people and you kind of elbow me. Who do you think you are being a teacher? And it was really wonderful because you could see that he did care for her and he gave her his blessings. But he was beginning to show me, even in the role of teacher that I was in then, he said, don't take yourself so seriously. This is just something else that we do in this world of birth and death. Not only about himself, he was very honest about the people around him. And he would laugh and tease, especially, you know, when people didn't look at themselves. I I remember when Ramdas came, I took uh, a group of friends and fellow teachers in, oh, in the mid-70s over to Asia. We went to India and Burma and Thailand and Joseph Goldstein, Ramdas, a bunch of us went together. And Ramdas had just been in Bali surfing and lying out on the beach. And he was probably in his mid 40s then or late 40s, probably. Um, but, uh, but still, you know, 15 or 20 years older than most of the other seekers around him. And he was trying to look young. I mean, he was into it, you know, <laughs> buffed Ramdas or something like that, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but he had his beard, you know, he was back from India and stuff like that. So we're all sitting around and most of us are like in our late 20s and there's Ramna sitting there. And Ajahn Chah looks at this group, I bow and I introduce these fellow teachers and friends. He looks around, the first thing he does is he says, who's the old guy you brought with you? I was like... (laughs) (laughs) He just called it like it was. There was a, there was a, a wealthy, a very, very uh, rich Thai uh, businessman who came in who had, um, I don't know, he'd owned part of the railways or something like that and just sold, sold it all and had this enormous amount of money and was now toward the end of his life was going to give it away. And he came in very kind of proud of what he'd done and he sat down and bowed to the teacher and said, I've made all this money and I have it and I'm not sure what to do with it. Should I give some to your monks in your monastery or should I build hospitals or schools kind of, or should I do some other great thing with it? And Ajahn Chah looked at him and he said, you know, when you come to the monastery, you cross that big bridge over the, over the river. I think you should take all the money and just throw it off the bridge. <laughs> and the guy's draw, jaw dropped. Because what he was listening to was all that see how important I am. And he said, well, why don't you just throw it off the bridge? Maybe some fishermen will find it, you know. And when we'd sit around and the visitors would come, we'd sit with him and all the monks and nuns would, you know, be around. Um, He would sometimes describe us to the visitors. He said, you you should see this because it was like the seven dwarfs or something like that. This is sleepy. This is my monk who sleeps all the time, you know. 
I don't know how he can sleep so much. And uh, she's always sick. I don't know what it is with her, but one thing after another, she's... And this monk loves to eat. I mean, you should see him when he gets his bowl in the morning. It's like the biggest thing in his day. And he would just laugh. And that one, you know, he had three wives before he became a monk. Two of them at the same time. Can you imagine that? Talk about suffering, right? (laughs) And this one, this one just meditates all the time. I can't get him to live a life. He just wants to sit there and meditate like this. I don't know. You know, maybe he's afraid to relate or something like that. Me, I like to play teacher. My role here is to kind of name all these things, you know. And um, when he came to visit our center in Massachusetts, uh, more than 20 years ago, the center in Barrie, it was a retreat going on which he helped to teach, a couple of different retreats. And uh, we did the walking meditation outside, people walking back and forth in silence. And he was very taken by how sincere the practitioners were. But he looked around one afternoon, watched all these people doing walking meditation. He said, this place is kind of like a hospital, isn't it? He said, maybe mental hospital. You know? <laughs> and then he went outside, and I walked around with him. He'd go where the people were doing walking meditation. He'd go up and he'd say, I hope you get well soon. I hope you get well soon. <laughs> but he did it with such kindness and kind of a twinkle as he did it that you just couldn't take yourself too seriously. So part of practice is just saying, this is how it is. We are all these strange human beings, and can we see ourselves as we are? And really seeing what's most, where it's most important to look. As he said, um, traditionally the Eightfold Path is taught as right understanding, right speech, right livelihood, and so forth, teachings that we've done here often at Spirit Rock. He said, but the true Eightfold Path is just here, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, a tongue, and a body. These are the eight doors that are the entire path and the mind or the heart is the one that walks the path. Know these doors, examine them, awaken to them, and all of the teachings will be revealed. That straightforward and that simple. The Dharma, he said, is like the water table. If you dig a well, if you dig into your own body and heart and mind, that Dharma will reveal itself. You will know the cause of suffering, the end of sorrow, and the possibility of freedom, You will know the same things that the Buddha and the elders have discovered. He said, what's important is not to watch others. He said, if you are judging other people, you're not practicing. He said, because you can never fix them. You have enough trouble fixing yourself. One of my teachers, he said, um, I had a teacher who made a lot of noise as he ate. He was sloppy, and yet he told us to be mindful. And I would watch him, and I would get so angry. I suffered. He didn't. He just enjoyed his food. There I was, having a hard time. He said, but some people drive slowly and still have a lot of accidents, and others know how to drive pretty quickly and they don't have any problem. He said, it's not for us to judge. If you look outside 5% and you look at your own heart 95%, that's about the right balance for your practice. And he would go around, you know, and um, people would ask him questions, and then someone said to him, uh, what, is the, what is the biggest difficulty with your you know, students and new disciples? What's the biggest problem with those who come here? And he said, their opinions, their ideas, their views about everything, about themselves, whether they're a bad person or a good person, you know, a beautiful person, an ugly person, they have so many views about themselves, usually incorrectly. And then views about spiritual life and how it should be and how others should be. They have so much worldly experience that their minds and hearts are already full and they don't know how to listen. You must empty your minds and hearts of opinions and views and judgments and only then can you be with things as they actually are. Only then can you free yourself. Sometimes he would just go up to people, you know, who were looking like they were having a hard time, and say, are you suffering today? And if they said no, he said, great, you know, have a good day. And if they said yes, he'd say, oh, must be attached. 
not judgment, just kind of an observation. Oh, it must be attached. How interesting. And then he would kind of tootle off to talk to somebody else. <clears throat> Letting us look at ourselves, directing us to our own hearts. He worked with the quality of liberation through the courage of the heart, of overcoming difficulty, and the spirit of letting go. The overcoming, when we were afraid, whatever kind of fear it was, um, he would say, turn into what you're afraid of, if you can do it, if you're able to, or when you're ready. So um, the first Dharma talk I gave, um, he gave me no preparation at all. It was in a big holiday in a room, you know, three times this side, filled with a, a thousand uh, villagers and people who'd come from this big Buddhist holiday, this temple. And in the middle of the night, we were up all night chanting and sitting and hearing teachings. He said, now there'll be a talk from the Western monk who's joined us in Lao, which was the local dialect. Um, no preparation, nothing. You go do it. You know, and he smiled and said, go ahead, you know, try it. And he knew I would be nervous. He said, it doesn't matter. You can be afraid. Just go do it. That was all. You know, or Ajahn Sumedho, who's a friend of mine, an abbot in England, um, who got afraid of, the, in the same way, of teaching and boring other people. So he said, Sumedho, get up there, give a talk to all these people. Sumedho gave a talk. It was okay, 45 minutes, an hour. Ready to get down. Ajahn Chah said, no, no, keep going. Another hour. You'd really tell them everything. Two hours. <laughs> Wanted to stop. No, no, keep going. Another hour, three hours. It was so boring. So Mato ran out of things to say. It was just over and over the same thing. But by the end of four hours of it, Ajahn Sumedho, you know, he was the young monk, he realized, well, you know, I mean, this is as bad as it's going to get. Right? <laughs> and it was the same. He would send you out in the forest when you were ready to live in a cave or to be alone, you know, and there were in those days still tigers and wild animals and so forth. And part of the tradition of the elders was to go and be with the great trees and with the winds and with the seasons and with the creatures of the forest. And he had this bag of roots and herbs and the things that the elders knew for healing medicines and so forth. Um, but the tigers were a big thing because they were the, they were kind of the wildest animal of those forests along with the of course, the wild elephants would leave you alone. But in this one book of, of Ajahn Shah's teacher, Ajahn Man, there's this description of this, this young monk who goes out um, to meditate in the, in the caves, in the forest. And there he is walking in meditation at night. And all of a sudden, he hears the sound at some distance of the tiger. And this sound in the farthest distance of the tiger will bring the greatest fear to the heart of the untrained monk. Distance, direction mean nothing to such a one. Their only thought is that the tiger is coming to make a meal of them at that very moment. No matter how vast the area is, or how true it is that you don't actually see the tigers that often, they're walking back and forth, and their mind starts to get quiet, and all they can do is picture the tiger. And then, ironically, what remains is that passage, not of peacemaking or loving kindness or the fearless heart, but simply the mantra that they recite, oh, the tiger is coming, the tiger is coming. <laughs> there must be another way to deal with tigers, he says. And so he would tell us to go out into the forest or to go where it's difficult or what was the place of our fear or attachment um, and open to it, not to try to fix it, not to try to make ourselves different. If you were someone who was afraid of being alone, he would send you to some little cave to live. But if you were someone who loved solitude, then he might assign you to the monastery on the road by Bangkok, where you had to meet all these people, because that was what was difficult for you. Be where you are, open to the whole dance of life, and discover that you can, you can trust this, the capacity of your heart to uh, rest in the middle of all of that, if you learn how to do it. I remember I was so sleepy in the beginning of my meditation, he said, fine. You're so sleepy, go sit on the edge of the well. He said, that'll help keep you awake because, you know, you fall in otherwise. Just 
be there and face it, whatever it was. If you're angry, I remember being really angry, he said, great, it's, it's a hot day. I mean, this is kind of like, like a sweat lodge or something. He said, go back to your hut, close all the doors and windows, little tin roof hut, hot season, put all your robes on, sit there and be angry and sit in the middle of the fire of anger until you learn about anger. Don't make it go away, don't try to fix it, just sit and be with that energy and let it get as big as it wants until you learn about it. Fantastic. Hated it, you know? And then I realized, oh, hatred, that's just a part of the anger. Or restless, you just sit there. Until he said, he, he said, you know, to meditate is a little bit like taking out a screw. Maybe it's been, you know, pretty tight in the wood for a long time. Maybe you need to even put a little bit of that, you know, WD-40 on it or something like that. But he said, slowly what you do is you unwind the things that have been held in the body and the griefs and longings and fears in the heart, you sit and you make a space for all that to untangle. And the fears and imaginings of the mind, it's like unscrewing that which is tense and tight within us, loosening the body and the heart and the mind. And as you do, you can learn about the forces of life. Said, um, grasping, study grasping, and whether it works for you. The example that he gave, let me see if I can find an example. He said, suppose you have an orchard, a beautiful orchard of mango trees or apple trees, and we're fond of it, you know, and it has a thousand apple trees in it. And then one day, suppose someone were to come take an ax and cut down one of our trees. Now we only have 999 trees, but they're our trees, he said. And we would, it, it, we would be so upset, we would die along with that tree. And it's not that he didn't love trees. He said, but we would get furious, and we'd have to set things straight, and we'd fight, and we'd kill over it and quarrel, even though we still had 999 trees in our orchard. How many things do you own? And how do you relate to them, he would ask. And what is the suffering you cause yourself because you think that they actually belong to you? Because they don't. We don't own anything. We don't even own our body. We get to use it. We rent it for a while. And then you have to turn it back in. That's the truth of it. To see its nature. But we think we possess all this stuff. Here's a, another example. He said it's like this dog. And the dog has been hungry for a while. And then it gets this huge amount of food, all the extra rice from the monk's bowl is sometimes put out for the animals in the monasteries. And there's one dog, and it's eaten everything it possibly can. But then it lies down near the rice, and it won't let any other dogs come. And it growls when they come by. He says, Rah! Its stomach is bloated. It can't eat one more bite, but it's going, Rah! Leave my rice alone. You know? And we're like that, aren't we? We hold on to things, he says, because this place in us of the wanting or the grasping mind, as soon as it gets one thing, it wants the next. And you can't satisfy it by getting more and more and more and more and more and more. You can only satisfy it by knowing its true nature and discovering that there is a liberation of the heart independent of anger or fear or longing or love or all of these states. And it's always there for us. So by overcoming was part of the way of practice, surrender, seeing clearly, and with humor, with compassion. And then the liberation, to face what's difficult, and finally to learn to let go. But letting go is not just letting go, it's also letting be. It's letting things be as they are, living with the seasons of spring and summer and autumn and winter, to rest with what is true in this world with a compassionate heart and a clear eye, to see with the heart of the Buddha. Part of the practice in the monastery, he said, was learning to let go. So my good friend Sumedho, the abbot in England, says the practice of letting go is very effective for modern people whose minds are obsessed by thinking and planning. You can simplify all your meditation training down to just two words, let go. Or you could say let be if you like. 
rather than trying to develop this practice and develop that and achieve this and go into that and read the sutras and study the Abhidharma and learn Sanskrit and Pali and the Prajnaparamita and take ordinations in the Buddhist and the Hindu and the Sufi traditions and write books and become a world-renowned authority on Buddhism. Instead of becoming the world's expert on Buddhism and being invited to great international Buddhist conferences, just let go. Let go. Let go. I did nothing but this for years in my practice. All these desires and fears and judgments would come, and I would simply let them go, let them be. So I'm making it very simple for you to save you from getting caught in incredible amounts of suffering. There's nothing more sorrowful than having to attend international Buddhist conferences. (laughs) Some of you might have the desire to become the Buddha of the age, Maitreya, radiating love throughout the world. But I suggest just be an earthworm, an earthworm who knows only two words, let go, let go, instead of all these grandiose ideas you have. You see, ours is called the lesser vehicle, the Hinayana. We have only these poverty-stricken practices. (laughs) And what Ajahn Chah called letting go was really the teaching of the middle path. Discovering as we do when we sit in meditation and the breath comes in and out and thoughts and images and plans and memories come, that we can rest in a kind of openness and balance, neither resisting nor judging what arises. We can rest in the space of the heart. You'll notice that there's this small sense of self, the body of fear, we call it, that arises and it has its opinions and fears and so forth. And it's not that you're supposed to get rid of that. That's a part of us as well. You can bow to it and say, oh, this, and then back to the breathing, back to the sense of space, to hold even that with compassion. This middle path he taught in so many ways. The, the meditation practice and the form of the monastery were very strict. But he said, remember, we use these to find freedom. You don't want to become a meditator professional meditator or a professional Buddhist, you know, spare your family, friends. (laughs) The villagers came to the Western monastery he had one year um, and complained because the monks who were there had put a Christmas tree in the monastery. And they said, you know, we built this little forest monastery for your Western disciples, not for them to make into a church or something like that. You know, why are they doing this? So he came over and had a meeting with them. And he said, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, these people are ordained to do Buddhist practice. But he said, I understand that the tradition of Christmas is one in which there's a great practice of generosity, just as we have in the Buddhist tradition. And that it's a reminder of the innocence of the heart, which we also have in our training. And I understand that the teachings that Christmas celebrates um, are also... uh, the teachings of compassion for all beings, which is part of our training. Um, And he said, so uh, I understand that um, in this compassion, the trainings include not to kill and not to steal, to honor one's father and one's mother, to um, uh, uh, follow the, what we call the practices of virtue. He said, so I agree with you, we shouldn't have Uh, Christmas celebrated in a Buddhist monastery, but there's so many good things I've heard about it. I think we'll call this day Chris (laughs) Budimus. And they can have their tree, you can have your Buddhist temple, and we'll all practice together. And he smiled and closed his eyes. So the idea wasn't that one gets locked into some spiritual practice, but that these are the vehicles the sitting meditation, the walking, the loving-kindness practice done over and over and over that bring us to know that freedom that is possible as a human being. What other difficulties do your students have? He was asked. He said, oh, doubting. What about doubts? What can I do? They will ask. He said, the doubting mind is natural. Everyone starts with doubts. You can learn from them. What is important is that you don't identify with your doubts. That is, you don't get caught up and believe them and spin in endless circles. Instead, step back with a kind heart and see who it is that doubts. See the whole process of thinking and doubting arise and pass away. 
and step outside of them and you will find a peace that's bigger than all the thoughts and imaginings. This is the way to learn from them. The same with all the spiritual ideas that people have. When he went to teach in England, the British Buddhist Society had invited him. And in one kind of fancy Buddhist tea that they had, there was one of the elder kind of doyen of the British Buddhist Society, this woman who had been reading texts for many years and quite devoted, but also very heady and intellectual. And she asked him um, all these questions about the Abhidharma and Buddhist psychology. He answered a few and she kept going on with these very abstract questions. And finally he looked up at her and he said, Madam, he said, you are someone like, you are like a, a person who keeps hens and goes around picking up the chicken shit instead of the eggs. Her jaw dropped open. Ooh. He said, there is nourishment to be found here in the chicken yard, but you're looking in the wrong place. What to do about judgment? The judgments we have toward ourselves or the judgments that others make of us. People, you know, everybody has ideas about how you should be and what we should do. And then we internalize it and we tell ourselves the same stories. And you sit in meditation and there are a thousand judgments. What to do with the judging mind? He said, suppose one morning you're walking to work and a man starts yelling insults at you. And as soon as you hear these pointed insults about your mind and your body and how you are, you get agitated. You don't feel good. You're angry. You're hurt. You want to get even. He does it publicly and loud. A few days later, another man comes to visit you and says, hey, that guy who abused you the other day, he's crazy. It's okay. He's kind of a mental patient. We all are kind toward him. But he's done that for years. He does it to everybody who walks by. Nobody takes notice of the content of what he says anymore very much. It's the same thing over and over. And as soon as this, you feel relieved. All the hurt and anger that's pent up within you melts away. Why? Because now you know the truth. You thought he was normal, right? And so you took him seriously, and it caused you to suffer. And then you realize, oh, he's mad. So are you. (laughs) There's a madness in your own mind just like him. Do you want to listen to it? Do you actually believe it? When you think it's normal, you get upset, you want to stop, you want to strangle some part of you or somebody else around you. But when you see the truth, this is just madness and it is not who you really are. This is the knowledge of the heart. For those who see the Dharma, judgments arise, opinions come and go, and yet we are free in their midst. When sitting in meditation, All these thoughts arise. You you can just say to yourself, that's not my business. It's just the mind thinking. It's the thinking mind. We need thoughts to do a certain amount of planning, but thought is a very poor master. It works better as a servant. You could have 5% of the amount of thoughts that you have during the day and do all the planning and thinking you need. And then you could smell the bay leaves from the trees and see the crescent of the moon as it comes out and the eyes of the lovers and people around you and, you know, um, tend to the things as you walk down the street that are alive in each moment. So it's not that he was against thinking, but that his invitation was to step out of all that right and wrong and come back to this great heart of a Buddha and say, yes, this is the dance of life and here I am in the midst of it. He put it this way, try to be mindful, compassionate, and let things take their natural course. Then the mind and heart will become still in any surroundings, like a clear forest pool. All kinds of wonderful and rare animals will come to drink at the pool. You'll clearly see the nature of all things. You'll see many things strange and wonderful come and go, but you will be still. This is the joy the happiness of the Buddha. He reminded us as well not to be in a hurry. You know, there's a kind of, we're so much in a hurry in our times and then it can creep into our spiritual life, a kind of, I've got to meditate and have something happen. You just sit 
and let things come and go and return back to this place of being exactly where we are. These days, everyone's in a hurry. Things are forced. Mangoes are never sweet now in the market. They're forced too. You know, our fruit, before they're ripe, they get picked and artificially ripened. It's done because people want to get them in a hurry. And then when you eat them, you find that they're sour. It's trying to match our desires to get things so fast. To have something sweet, something good, you have to let it be sour in its own time, according to its natural way, and then let them ripen. But we pick them early when they're still sour. Let yourself ripen, he says. Let your heart ripen and become sweet in its own. And all that takes is your patience, your inner respect, the kind of surrender that he taught in that forest, which is available in this room or in the place where you live, the courage of the heart to find the capacity to be present for the life that you have been given in this human realm. And from this comes a wisdom, a perspective, a a joy, the, the heart of a Buddha that opens in each of us. He said the business of Buddhist teaching is not to make more Buddhists, but it's to help people become happy and free like the Buddha was. You too can be so. The treasure, the jewels of the teachings are offered freely, open-handedly, immediate, simple. Why not give them a try? And the last passage I'll read from him. He says, When we come into a temple, often one takes refuge in the Buddha or the Dharma or the Sangha, the teachings. But what is this Buddha? When we see with the eye of wisdom, the heart of understanding, we discover that the Buddha is timeless, unborn, unrelated to any history or body or form. The Buddha is the ground of all being, the truth of the unmoving mind. So when you understand in yourself deeply, the Buddha was not enlightened in India. In fact, he was never enlightened. He was never born and never died. And this timeless reality, this timeless Buddha, is our true home, our abiding place. When we take refuge in this, all things in the world are free for us. They become our teachers, proclaiming the one true nature of life. So it's one thing to come to a <clears throat> spiritual center or, <clears throat> or a monastery and listen to teachings that have been handed down for many generations. And it's beneficial, it's a reminder. But more deeply, it is in each of our own ways to take that peace that touches our heart and say, yes, compassion, attention, liberation, That is possible in my own life. We know what needs more compassion and what's possible, you know, to face. We know what it's time to look at and work with. And absolutely you can trust that this way of compassion, this way of forgiveness, this way of listening and attention will lead you to freedom. It has for thousands of years for human beings. It is by seeing the truth and opening the heart to this world that we find what the Buddha found and what all the elders and sages have. So let's sit for a minute. Of course. And then your heart and mind will become still in any surroundings, like a clear forest pool.
So just a couple of very brief announcements and then a little chant before we go out into the night. Um, Next week we'll be back down in the community meditation hall. Again, if this uh, land and place at Spirit Rock would serve you in any way, come and take a walk in the woods or join us for a retreat or classes, whatever, whatever would be a, a blessing or help to you. Um, we really feel open. And you don't have to become a member. And there isn't a joining you. The fact that you're here means it's now one of your places if it would serve you. Um, like to request that um, s- some people help with the chairs, that the folding yellow chairs be put upstairs in the closet in the walking room, that maybe a dozen folding uh, of the brown chairs be put in each of the um, big interview rooms downstairs. Where do the other brown chairs go? They go in the building, so we can just... Okay. Um, the other brown chairs you can leave here. The red chairs can go on the side and the mats can get stacked up and then we can clean the room. So for those of you who have time to help with that, we'd appreciate it. Drive carefully. It's getting dark again. Available for opening or letting go. Just this one word, ah. And we'll sing it together a little bit. You can feel what your body or heart or mind wants to let go of this evening so you can be more open as you go out into your life. Ah, add harmony. Ah, ah, ah. in a compassionate and peaceful heart in the week ahead. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.